So for everyone that brought food, thank you very much. Even though even though there's no ribs, from what I hear, it's <clears throat> it's okay. We'll, we'll get by. Um, there is coffee and banana nut bread that Nani made fresh this morning. It's very good. That's in the kitchen, and then the restrooms are around the side and to the right. And the Book of Revelation study for the young adults. That's Friday. We're gonna should start next week, hopefully. And um, so if you're interested in the young adult study, let me know. And then communion will do the third Sunday of uh, March. And uh, the Revelation study with Pastor Brett on Wednesdays at 6.30. So if you would like to join us and you need the login info, let Pastor Brett know. Um, And that's it for announcements. And just as we're going through the book of Luke, I just want to read from John 20, verses 30 and 31. Um, It says, uh, therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. So, you know, the Gospel of John, and then also the other Gospels. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So just as we're going through the Gospel of Luke, that we remember that God had people write these events down so that we will believe that Jesus is the Son of God and he's our Savior, that he died for our sins. And so uh, with that, Lord, we thank you that you sent Jesus to die for our sins and that you, um, you preserved your word, that we can have it today, that we can know who you are, that we can believe and, and be saved and have, have a relationship with you because we know that you are our good Father and that you love us. And just uh, bless the service that we have today and thank you for this fellowship and um, just everything, everything that you bless us with. In Jesus' name, amen. And thank you, Scott. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Yeah, and it's good to have someone I know from Park Terrace. Uh, Maria, thank you. God bless you. Welcome. Yes, so let's get into the word if you have your... Oh, wait, we have one more announcement. Uh, Dave, come on up. Yeah. You want the mic? All right, real quick. Uh, most of you know we've uh, supported some military soldiers that were in need for over the Thanksgiving period. And uh, you guys uh, donated, we, our church donated uh, some uh, gift cards for the turkeys and things like that. And this Cornerstone, the other, the other church, Stone Creek. Stone Creek uh, donated uh, other uh, food products and things like that. So uh, uh, we had a commander come out not too long ago. Uh, I wanted to award this to uh, our church and Pastor Brett and the body of living water. So I'll briefly read what it says. Uh, It says, Pastor Brett and members of Living Water Community Church, for your generosity, thoughtfulness, and commitment to soldier care by providing 55 grocery store cards to soldiers and their families within the 100th Troop Command Brigade. During this season of giving and thanksgiving, we sincerely appreciate your tangible love and concern for our soldiers and their families. May God bless you richly for your generosity and your support of our guardians of freedom. Uh, Colonel David Church, nice name, he has a church name. So anyway, uh, God bless you guys, it really made an impact. I got to see the, the faces that, it, it, uh, that these things, the, these uh, packages serve these soldiers that were in need. And I'll tell you, it's a tough economy we live in right now. And, uh, and these guys are serving. They're going out there to uh, show up every, every day of the week. And so when we can step up as a church, it means a big deal. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. All right. Well, the Gospel of Luke. Last week, we covered the Beatitudes, Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 36. And they're all summed up really in love, loving God, loving others. And today, Jesus is going to give us several proverbs dealing with the law of reciprocity. 
Who knows what that law is? Could we say it's like the golden rule? Yeah, do unto others as you would like them to do unto you. Luke, uh, we covered last week, it's really the central theme of the Beatitudes. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. And that's kind of a biblical principle, but it's not only in the Bible, but it's in our conscience. You know, God has given every man, woman, and child that's born on this planet a conscience, a concept of right and wrong, and that is kind of built into that. That's why many religions have the golden rule, that kind of idea. You know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's really all throughout the world. Paul sums it up. Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, you can turn to Galatians chapter 6, 7 through 10. And I think Paul sums it up for us there. It says, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For one who sows to his flesh will from his flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have the opportunity, let us do good to some people. No, all people, (laughs) especially those who are of the household of faith or other believers. So I love that. So let's dive into our text today. It's Luke chapter 6. We'll cover verses 37 and finish the chapter through 49. Two do's and a don't right away. Luke chapter 6, verse 37. Do not judge so that you will not be judged, and do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. All three of those terms are legal terms uh, that would be used in a court of law. And the idea is we don't act like a judge and condemn people. In fact, God tells us don't do that, but pardon them. However, the Bible does tell us we are to judge people. So it seems contradictory, but the idea is this. We judge people by what the Word of God says, not what our opinion is. Does that make sense? And so it's not us actually judging them, but it's God's Word that judges them, and we just proclaim what God's Word says. Okay, so we don't act like judges and give them our opinion. So that's where we do not judge so that you will not be judged. Don't condemn so that you won't be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. But if there are sin or false doctrine, we're commanded to correct them. In fact, Luke 17, 3 says, Be on guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. The word rebuke there in the Greek is a severe rebuke. It's not like, oh, man, you're, you're, you're caught up in this great sin. I'll come alongside you and let's kind of help you through this. It's like, brother, you are sinning against the Lord, and God disciplines his kids, and we give them a strong, in love, rebuke. It's not done in churches today. Churches today tolerate sin. It's like leaven that comes into the churches. Uh, If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. So we need to be a people of forgiveness. Amen. We are also called to be fruit inspectors. Did you know that? So every time you go to the grocery store, no, no, I'm just kidding. So Matthew 7, 15 says, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's a scary thing. We are saved simply by faith, but after we are saved, we abide in Christ, and the fruit of the Holy Spirit begins to grow in us, and we become more like Christ. So then you will know them, or you can discern them, or we could say judge them by their fruits. 
Do they have the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Are they obeying the commandments of Christ? And we're commanded to judge. In fact, 1 Corinthians 6, 2 says, Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? In fact, folks, we need to be discerning. We need to have a discerning spirit when we read the Bible, when we see other believers. So we do judge those in the church, but not those outside of the church. 1 Corinthians 5.9, Paul said, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous or swindlers or the idolaters, for then you would have to come out of the world. But actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother. If he is a moral person, covetous, idolater, reviler, drunkard, swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? And, you know, if we really put that to practice, there would be no hypocrites in church. Because everybody would be truly Christ followers, striving to be pleasing to the Lord. Interesting. Verse 13, but those who are outside God judges, remove the wicked man from among yourselves. You see, church is not a place to tolerate wickedness or tolerate sin. It's a place where sinners can come and repent and be delivered from their sin. Does that make sense? Okay, praise the Lord for that. So how do we do that? Jesus told us in Matthew 18, 15, if your brother sins, go. And by the way, sin is missing the mark. That can be doctrinal error. That could be a sin like lying, cheating, stealing, adultery, homosexuality, all those other sins. Okay, those are sins. They're all sin. If your brother has a doctrinal issue, he's missed the mark even doctrinally or in sin, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, Take one or two with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or tax collector. Meaning, don't eat with them. They're considered unclean. You can't do anything with them. Essentially, it's not us who judge, though, but God's word judges. We simply declare that they're missing the mark, and the mark is the standards and the commands in Scripture. All of them. We don't just pick the ones we like. <laughs> Second Timothy 4.2, Paul said, Preach the word, not your opinion. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. What is sound doctrine? Everything the Bible teaches, the whole thing, all the commands in Scripture, especially the New Testament for New Covenant saints, for the time will come when they're not going to endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside to myths or stories. Back to our text, verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. For by the standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. You know, you can't outgive God. No matter what, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. But he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one must do as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You know, as believers, we should be transformed to the point where we like to give. We like to help. It's not like, oh, man, they're asking again. 
grudgingly. Don't do that. God wants cheerful givers. We want to help people. It's a mark of a believer. Uh, Malachi 3.10 says, Bring the whole tide to the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord. I will, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out to you a blessing until it overflows. I think Becky made a sign for us out there and put that scripture on it. Thank you, Becky. Oh, it's such a beautiful sign. That's on it. Back to our text. Verse 39. And he spoke a parable to them, said, A blind man cannot guide a blind man, can he? Will they not both fall into a pit? Matthew clarifies what uh, Jesus is saying here and what Luke uh, described. Matthew lets us know it's the Sadducees and the Pharisees that are blind. In fact, Matthew 15, 14 says, let them alone, the Sadducees, the Pharisees. They are blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. All right, they're false teachers. They are spiritually blind. Matthew 23, 24, you blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and, and of the dish, but the inside are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside may become clean as well. They were all about outer appearances, but inwardly they were ravenous wolves leading people astray. Same with false teachers today. So back to our text, verse 40. A pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. You know, Jesus here is just giving us proverbs, proverbial sayings as he's teaching the crowd and the disciples. The whole of our faith journey is to be more like Christ. To be his hands and feet extended to a lost and hurting world. That's where we got that saying, what would Jesus do? Remember when we had bracelets, WWJD, and, you know, the whole thing. It's like, what would Jesus do? Uh, I like to do this, though. Instead of thinking what he might do, I like to ask him what he wants me to do. Does that make sense? And he will guide you, and he will speak to you, because we can fantasize what Christ might do. The chosen is a good example. A lot of that's not in Scripture, but it is we're trying to figure out maybe this is how it went down. Does that make sense? So it's our best guess about the life of the disciples. And, you know, it's fun to watch and see that. But really, what would God have me do in this situation? It's being led by the Spirit. The more mature we are, the more we begin to look like Jesus, act like Jesus, And we begin to love people like Jesus did. Galatians 2.20 says, For I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So we must examine ourselves before we examine others, right? Even though we're commanded to examine, to be fruit inspectors. And our, in our text, Jesus tells us how. Luke chapter 6, verse 41. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye and do not notice the log in your own eye? We've all heard that a hundred times, right? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that's in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye And then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. It doesn't say we can't discern a speck in our brother's eye, but first we need to self-examine. Where am I disobedient to God? Where am I being disobedient to the clear teachings of Scripture? Where am I being disobedient? Get the log out, and then we can rightly help others with the sins that so easily beset them. We must be obedient to God's word in all things, James 1.23, but if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. And once he has looked at himself and gone away, he immediately has forgotten what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides in it, 
not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. You know, we need to approach the Word of God like, Lord, as I read this, is there something that I am off course or off doctrinally that I need to get in line with your Word? Is there something I'm doing that's not pleasing to you? We read the Word of God to be a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, to stay on the narrow path as we're being obedient to the Lord. 2 Peter 1, 2 says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. The qualities we need to have to demonstrate obedience to God, Peter gives us in that text. 2 Peter 1, 5, now for this very reason also, applying diligence in your faith, number one, supply moral excellence, number two, knowledge, number three, of the word of God and of Christ, self-control, perseverance, or cheerfully enduring, godliness, brotherly kindness, and it's summed up in love. Those are the qualities that we as obedient children who are looking more like Christ every day, I pray, I guess we should grow our hair long like the dude on TV, huh? No. (laughs) Uh, Grow our beards and do it. For if these qualities are yours and increasing, we don't stagnate, we're always growing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The only way to have these qualities is to abide in Christ. How do we abide in Christ? It's spending time with the Lord in prayer, in his word, in praise. John 15, 1, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, so it may bear more fruit. I hate the pruning. How about you guys? It hurts. I mean, all of a sudden, there's a bush outside of our window that I planted, and it's, uh, oh, my goodness, what are those? They're, they're big thorns, and they have these red flower, yes, bougainville, yeah, and they, and they make it to look like a little tree, right? Okay, so I, I planted because I thought that was cool, and we had nothing outside our, our condo window. I didn't ask the association's permission. Forgive me, Lord. Uh, And I planted it there, but it got big, you know, and I would go out and barely trim it, and I would get all cut up, and, you know, uh, and it just wasn't healthy. And finally, we got a new landscape company, and so they trimmed it down to nothing. It looked bare, and it's like, what What did you do to our bush? You know, and it wasn't healthy, because I was barely trimming it. It was just, and they trimmed it down. I'm like, and they go, oh, no, no, just wait. It will be beautiful, and sure enough, come, come not, many long, not long after, it was like bigger than it was and fuller and beautiful. But God sometimes prunes us. And it's not discipline, and it's not battle from Satan. It's simply God pruning us so that we can bear more fruit. Amen? I hate those seasons, though. Just, I don't like it. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, and apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. And that brings us back to our text, verse 43. For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor, on the other hand, bad tree which produces good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil for his mouth speaks that which fills his heart again it's a matter of the heart just like the beatitudes 
Back to Matthew 12, 34. You brood of vipers. This is Jesus talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees and priests. How can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for in the day of judgment. That's scary. <laughs> you know, for me, typically my speech is seasoned with grace, and I do okay. But occasionally, you know, someone will cut me off or... My wife will do something that's ultimately good, but I didn't take it that way. And I might say something I shouldn't have said. <laughs> Usually, as soon as the words cross my lips, I'm like, oh, shoot, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> Lord, forgive me. Every careless word, consider that. That's why maybe in Proverbs we're, we're told, be quick to hear and slow to speak, and in the New Covenant as well. Man, be careful for your words, for by, the wor by your words you will be justified. This is heavy. And by your words you will be condemned. Part of our good fruit is having words that are good for edification, that build people up, that correct, because the loving thing to do uh, to someone who's practicing something wrong, the loving thing is to correct them, Right? or kids that are doing things that are bad or ultimately bad for them, we correct them in love. That's a loving thing. But by our words, we are justified, and by our words, we'll be condemned. We must articulate our faith. Not just live it, but we have to declare it. Romans 10, 8. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, we need to confess it. For, uh, for with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. It's declaring that we're believers. Luke 12, 8 says, And I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will confess him also before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men, uh, he will deny before the angels of God. So back to our text, verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? You know, it's been said, maybe you've heard this, if Jesus isn't Lord of all, he isn't Lord at all. You see, Christ wants us to surrender our life to him. We have been bought with a price. We belong to him. We crucify our flesh and allow Christ to be Lord of all. And when Christ is Lord, believe me, we're obedient to the commands in Scripture. Every command in the New Testament is Jesus' command to the church and to believers. Paul clarifies that in 1 Corinthians 14.37. But if anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize the things I write to you are the Lord's command. But if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. You know, the whole New Testament is written by God to us. Churches that are ordaining homosexuals or women or embracing lifestyles the Bible condemns are apostate and cannot love Jesus. That's a bold statement. That's a hard statement. I hate to say that. Why do I say that? Because Jesus tells us, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You know, we want to please God more than we want to please the world or fit in with the world or fit in with societal norms. It is our desire overwhelmingly to obey the Lord through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus answered and said to them, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my word, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. And on judgment day, 
when Christ is judging, many are going to say, hey, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We, we served you. We did all of this. And he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. If we want to be a friend of Jesus, you are my friends if you do what I command. Folks, it scares me when I see whole denominations abandoning the truth of Scripture. It scares me when I see churches do this because we all have the Holy Spirit. We all have that prompting of the Spirit to be obedient children, but they embrace lifestyles that go against the Word of God. And they embrace sin that the world has accepted, that the Bible condemns. God's Word, folks, is our sole source of faith, orthodoxy, that's doctrine, and practice, orthopraxy, or living out our faith, our practice. It is our sure foundation for life. Amen? I mean, we are solidly camped on the Word of God. If we do that, we know we're okay. So back to our text. We're about to finish the chapter, verse 47. The wise man and the foolish man. We all know this one. Uh, Luke 6, 47. Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when the flood occurred and the torrent burst against that house, it could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who has heard and does not act accordingly is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation. And the torrent burst against it and immediately it collapsed and the ruin of that house was great. What is our foundation? Jesus Christ and the word of God. That's it. I like Matthew's version of this better, Matthew 7, 24, and this is the one we're familiar with. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may com be compared to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against the house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them, that's all the commands in the New Testament, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Jesus and the Word of God are our foundation. 1 Corinthians 3.11, For no man can lay a foundation other than that which was laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. But if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, yet he himself will be saved as though through fire." Why will he still be saved? Because at least he was still building on the foundation, the rock, Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Okay, good. All right. Ephesians 2.19 says, So then you are no longer strangers or aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, which is the church, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. The apostles and the prophets are a reference to the whole Bible. The old covenant and the new covenant. That is our foundation. And if, if you just pick and choose what you want to obey out of especially new covenant theology, you're in deep trouble and you're not founded on the rock in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom also you are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. In the storms of life, we stand on the rock, Jesus Christ and the Word of God. We examine everybody with discernment by the Word of God and by the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. 
That's how we weather storms. We stand on the promises of God as we're obedient to his word. Jesus holds us and helps us through every trial. Amen? If we let him. (laughs) But we have not because we ask not. We need to ask him, Lord, help me. Lord, I need your help to experience the goodness of God. Jesus Christ and the word of God must be our foundation. If the foundation of our lives, our faith, our walk are on Jesus and the Word of God, we can face any storm with confidence and peace. God is faithful, and He will hold us through every battle and bless us as we are obedient to His Word and abiding in Christ. So today, I want to remind us that God is faithful and He loves you. But we need to try to be obedient children. You know, just like parents, when their kids, you parents know this, or grandparents, when they're disobedient and rebellious, you can't bless them. You can't really help them. You, can't, you have to discipline them, and that's how God treats us. But if they are repentant and they're trying to be pleasing and obey the rules that you've established as parents, you want to bless them. God is always faithful, and he loves us. And we need to experience his goodness every day, even in the midst of battle. Amen? Why don't we stand? And Father God, we just ask that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would fill us. God, that you would illuminate your word to our hearts and to our minds. And God, I pray that you would give us the strength to be pleasing children. Lord, that if there's any ways in us that are displeasing to you, God, I pray that you would just show that to us so that we can repent and just be pleasing kids that you can bless and help through all of life's difficulties. So, God, we love you this morning with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. In Jesus' name, amen. And whatever you're facing, I love this Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. I will hold you and carry you through all of life's challenges. Let's sing this song to the Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me And all my days I've been held in your head From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God Of the goodness of 
faithful. You know, if you're in a spot where you're like, God, where are you? You know, he hasn't left you. Possibly you just can't see him and you haven't been close enough to feel and experience the goodness of God. But he's always faithful and always with you. Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And that's the rapture. So God is with you. So rest in the Lord this week. The battles, the challenges that you're facing, ask him to help you and give you wisdom and strength and courage to face those as a man or woman of faith or a young person of faith, Noah, because God loves you so very much. Amen. God bless you. It's potluck. And uh, I think we'll just pray for the food now. Dave, you want to pray for it? Come on up. Or, yeah. Heavenly Father, oh God, we just want to thank you for the time that we spend here worshiping you, Lord God, and we just ask that you bless the food that we are about to partake. Thank you for all that have contributed, all the contributing hands that brought the food, and we love you in everything you do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.